Um, because we have a time constraint, we will have to proceed immediately without interruption. I hope you are not too exhausted. Uh, Eva, would you like to be the first one to talk? So I, I yeah, please, how long? About 20 minutes, is it okay? As you like, yes. So while you put the PowerPoint, uh, I'll say some words. I suppose almost everyone here knows Professor Eva Yablonka uh, of the Korn Institute for the History of Philosophy and Science and Ideas at Tel Aviv University. She is working in evolutionary development biology, epigenetic inheritance, behavioral ecology, language and cultural evolution, history of genetics and the philosophy of science. Um, in a way, as you know, speaking about renegade uh, scholars and renegade disciplines, maybe epigenetics for a time was considered a kind of a rene uh, renegade discipline and uh, at a certain time even laughable, but this is no longer the case and some people present epigenetics, as you know, as the next stage, the discipline, the discipline of the 21st century. Um, please uh, go ahead. Well, I didn't really, I was not sure what uh, Alex is going to talk about. So uh, I, I, did, I just prepared a PowerPoint, so it will cue, it's, it's a cue for me, really. And uh, I, I know his book very well, I read it. And uh, I guess that he will present the major, the, the general picture here. So what I want to do here is, first of all, to acknowledge, yes, okay, uh, to acknowledge uh, the contribution of this book. I think it is very, very important to put together the many, many strands of, of, of research that have something, that have something to do with uh, what we call cultural evolution. Now, the kind of, what I want to say here is not to repeat anything that Alex says. I think, as I say, I, I, I think it is very important to do this. I want to, uh, to introduce additional considerations and a complementary kind of approach to what he is doing. I think that it is important to realize that there is an evolutionary, strong evolutionary aspect it, when we're looking at, uh, at, at cultural history. We can follow and study it as an evolutionary system in the Darwinian sense, as Alex Masudi has explained. But it is also important to realize that we, are, that we have, that the this, this system has certain properties that are captured by developmental thinking in biology. So the kind of uh, analogs that we have to use, the metaphor that we can use, the tools of thought that for us can come from both evolutionary biology and developmental biology. And I want to say a few words about this. So I will start with my own definition of culture, which is uh, very much based, I think, on what many uh, uh, sociologists would say, uh, classical kind of sociologists would say, especially Durkheim. It is a system view of, uh, of culture. Culture is a system. It's a system or network of socially acquired and transmitted patterns of behavior, including, in the case of humans, ideas and norms, preferences and products of activity that characterize a community of interacting individuals. So it is a system, and as a system, we have to, to understand the interactions between the different elements within this system. Culture is this whole system. It is the practices, the products, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, and behaviors, and ideas, and preferences. All these things form a system. Evolution is a very general kind of, uh, I define it in a very, very general way, deliberately, as does Alex is a change in the frequency and nature of heritable types over time. And it doesn't have to be genotypes. It can be all kinds of types. Now, the important thing from the point of view that I want to discuss here briefly is that dynamic stability 
the system, the, the cultural system is a very, very dynamic system. Dynamic stability is also an evolutionary phenomenon. For example, if we're looking at a, at a population of, let's say, yeast cells, and we see that the genotype frequencies are stable, one of the things we're asking ourselves is, why are they stable? We're not taking it for granted. Maybe there is some kind of selection that is keeping this system stable over time, because there are processes like random drifting populations. So if we see that there is no change, even though the population is not, is not infinite, well, we ask ourselves, why is it the case? Okay, so dynamic stability is one of the things that interests us as evolutionary biologists and as people who study systems. And as a socio and sociologist, when they are looking at the social system, one of the things that they can ask themselves is, why is this system, that, why does this system persist over time? I mean, things change in the world. And then, once we understand why the system persists, we can also understand much better why the system changes. But in the same way that we have to understand heredity in order to understand hereditary variation and selection. So we have to understand the system, the dynamic system, that, keep, that, that are responsible for persistence. Now, human cultural evolution is the historical process of changes in human culture over time. Human culture is a very, very special type of culture. It's different from animal culture in important ways. So what I want to suggest here as a complementary, uh, uh, to complement the kind of uh, approach that uh, Alex has pr produced is a kind of development and system uh, theory uh, approach to culture. So from this point of view, a cultural system is a very dynamic entity made up of many, many different uh, things, people, institutions, practices, ideas, to which, into which individuals are introduced, in which they develop, and to which they co uh, contribute. This system gets reconstructed with modifications, of course, using inputs mediated by past and present individual and collective activities and products. Okay, this is how I see, this is a kind of developmental system uh, approach to, to culture. And so we want to understand the dynamics of this system, especially starting with the dynamics of persistence. And uh, the kind of approach that I'm describing has been very much influenced by Waddington. Waddington presented Wellington was a, 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 an embryologist, and, but also a geneticist. He was also a paleontologist and a, ge a geologist. I mean, he, he was dancing on many weddings, as we say in Hebrew. And, uh, he, uh, and he, he described the developmental system as a system that converges at the end of, of a relatively stable and, uh, and uh, predictable phenotype output, in spite of many, many variations in uh, genetic variations and environmental gen uh, variations. So when you're looking at the population of flies, for example, in the field, you say, wow, they're so similar. But when you're looking at the genes, the genes are not always similar. There's quite a lot of variations in the, uh, in the population. You are looking at the environment, it's not that similar either. And each of them had its own unique developmental history. So why is it? that we, they, they, we, uh, they end up all so similar. Why do we all have a nose, ears, things like that? I mean, why are we all more or less normal in spite of the variations between us? This is quite a very, very profound question and we must understand it. And in the same way that we must understand this, we must also understand why is it that a very, very dynamic system, it's not a developmental system in the sense that embryological development is a developmental system, but it is a developmental system in the sense that it is a system that is ongoing all the time, all kinds of changes, and nevertheless persists over time. So this is the kind of, this is the kind of approach that we want to adopt. So here is something that we call the social, social landscape, and the different values in this landscape are uh, the kind of uh, more or less stable uh, stable, uh, let's say, professions, institutions, ways or uh, practices that individuals within this total landscape adopt. And they can come to this kind of attractors, if you want, this kind of bits in the landscape, in spite of the fact that they can start their 
trajectory in several different places. So what we call a, a social landscape is a dynamic pattern of life in a particular community, which is the outcome of many, many factors, ecological factors, social factors, and ep ep uh, epistemological factors which are constructed by the people themselves. It is something that happens while walking. It's a path creating while walking. It's true that there are paths already there, and it's easy for us to walk in paths already created by the previous generations, but we all the time create and recreate them. So, so there is a lot of niche construction going on at all levels, the psychological, the epistemological, the ecological, the social. And an individual develops within this, uh, this landscape and contributes to it, usually by reinforcing and, and going through already existing paths. And this is, uh, uh, well, this is uh, influenced by a sociologist, by Giddens, for example, who is describing social system in, in this kind of terms. So, I, what I want to say is that the, the trajectories in this picture, there are two landscapes there and there are two trajectories. Uh, I mean, is the, the, the fat black trajectory is the one that most people walk, they, it's the attractor, that's where most people go through and it's an attractor they end up in, but there is an alternative one. And people can move to another landscape, to a different landscape, social landscape. It's not very common usually at least not in pre 21st century societies, but it does happen. And, uh, and, and as people walk in trajectories, they usually deepen them, and sometimes people create new trajectories. And uh, the social attractor is a region in the landscape where people sort of, where individual people settle, and they do their, th their social thing. And it is a theoretical construct, constructed by the sociologist. It, the sociologist, he or she, defined this. This is what I'm interested in. This is what I want to study. And it is usually something that does have something to do with reality. Yeah? And uh, of course, a social landscape, a particular social landscape, let's say the Tel Aviv University academic community, is part of a larger landscape in which it settles more or less completely. So I want to give just one example, because I don't, uh, just one, one example, and that is urban poverty in the USA, which uh, shows us how we, when we want to understand the dynamics of the system and why something persists over time, we have to take to understand the interactions between different factors within this system that create this stability over time. If we understand these interactions and understand the cybernetic structure of the system, then we, are, we, have enough, uh, we will understand better why it changes, for good or for bad. And where we can intervene, usually we, we have to intervene in several places. So let's have a look. So in the USA, for example, children that are born to the lowest quantile, 20% of the social economic ladder, have only 1% of ending at the highest. And this is compounded by the fact that, well, if, if, if we take the, 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 uh, just the 1% of the poorest, the chances of them escaping the poverty cycle is very, very small indeed. So it's not good for anyone to be poor, right? People certainly do not choose to be there. It doesn't increase their fitness, whatever that means in this sense. But nevertheless, they don't have a, they, there is very small chance of them escaping them. So why? What are the, what, what are the factors that combine together and, uh, and interact together to let them stay in this. So there are many factors, right? So there are social, culture, uh, uh, social structural factors, including the kind of jobs available, the education of parents, the quality of schools, the structure of the state welfare system. All these things, we, we, can, we can put them into little boxes and draw arrows among them, among all of these different factors, and try and see how they influence each other, how they create feedback loops, that are self-reinforcing and so on. Meaning-making pro uh, processes that people use in order to make sense of their lives. How do they justify their own position in their own life? How is this justification important for the kind of life that they are living? How does it help them or hinder their ability to escape this? Uh, all kinds of biological epigenetic factors, uh, for example, junk food. 
Junk food is not good for you, junk, for, for your, uh, for your uh, physiological and cognitive development. And the, the food that your mother eats is also very, very important for your development. And uh, uh, certainly toxins like alcohols and drugs and things like that, they co all can contribute to the ongoing perpetuation of this kind of cycle. Right. And there is also a fact that those who make it and leave the cycle leave the society. They do not contribute to it. So, okay, I'm not going to talk about this. Now, the point is, so there are, there are other examples that one can give. This is a particular example when we can see very clearly both the, uh, the epigenetic and the, uh, the, uh, the social uh, contributions. And if we, if we will understand how they all interact, we shall be in a much better position to understand the stability of the system and also to understand how we should intervene in this particular system. So what this uh, uh, landscape metaphor and a network metaphor allows us to do is to consider the relevant factors and processes that make up the social landscape without a priori granting a privileged position to any one factor. So in some cases, genetic differences are not important at all. In other cases, they can be important. For example, if we want to understand why connexin deafness, a form of de deafness, has increased twofold in the United States in the last 200 years, we have to understand that it is a genetic phenomenon. We have to understand it. We have to, uh, but we have to, uh, but we have to understand it here in this case, in a social context, because it is the result of the introduction of sign language into into the American society, which has changed the status of this chief of people and the probability of who will they will marry, because deaf people will marry deaf people or uh, uh, kin siblings. Of deaf, people, uh, of deaf people who carry the same gene, and so on. So in this case, it is very important. In the case of poverty, it doesn't seem like, uh, like genetics is very important. Epigenetics can be quite important. We don't know how important it is relative to other factors. And all these factors interact, so we cannot say this is the most important, that this is, you know, this is, in, uh, the, this is the most important factor. We can compensate also for some kind of uh, for, 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 uh, for the contribution of one particular factor by changing another or changing the network, and so on. So we have to consider all these things. We have to think about different, different types of, different, different we have to take into account different considerations, different inputs into the construction of the society. And we can ask all kinds of questions. For example, if there is very, very strong persistence in biology, we call it canalization uh, within a society. What, how can we, can, can we have some measure of it? Can we, can, can we, what can we say about it? What can we look, can we define it? Can we say, well, this is very, very canalized, this is very persistent, or is likely to be very persistent, because we have all these feedbacks within, within the system, all these self-reinforcing processes and so on. Uh, how do early events scaffold later events, right? So if, if this is a develop, it's a, it's a kind of system that develops, well, maybe something in the history sort of very, very strongly scaffolds something else and leads to almost inevitable de development of something. Nothing is inevitable. Things can be changed, but are very likely, and so on. So we can ask a lot of questions about this, which are related to the structure, to the cybernetic structure, so to speak, of the system. So we can also ask how do uh, landscape change? And there are all kinds of considerations that we can introduce here, like internal uh, conflicts within the network and, uh, and uh, influences between the networks and all kinds of things like this. So one of the things that I like about it is that like the approach that Alex was describing, it's a very, very fundamentally uh, interdisciplinary project because we have to take into consideration a lot of different things. If we will just describe it on one level, it will just not do. We will not understand the system. We have, I mean, it's not, and of course, there, it's not as if we, we don't know in advance what is the most relevant level, because it may be that one level is irrelevant. As I said, in some cases, genetic differences are absolutely irrelevant. But we don't have, 
we, we, we can't assume ev uh, things like that. We have to sh show that they are indeed irrelevant in this case. And in many cases, they are. So, okay, that's it. So this is what I just wanted to say. And, uh, and I just wanted again to say very, many, many thanks uh, to Alex for uh, initiating this kind of thinking and, uh, and, uh, and, and doing all this very hard and very wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you very much.